Good evening all. We are trying to figure out where we go from here, where at the end of this week, beyond Monday, we go from here. And I suppose this evening's conversation is part of three that we're running this week. Yesterday we were trying to reflect on the meaning of the death of the Queen. Today we're trying to do something which is, if you like, more looking at the immediate future and the reign of King Charles III, what we know of him so far and where that will take us journalistically. And tomorrow we're going to try and go a little deeper into the emotional impact of the news. We've been talking a little about whether there's space at some point to do a podcast that we're loosely calling How Does That Make You Feel, right? Which is the emotional responses to what happens in the news. Um, so today is, if you like, the kind of more traditional sort of boring news one. So <laughs> don't be surprised I'm doing it. I'll tell you where I come at this story and I'll be kind of as, as honest as I can be. When I arrived at The Times, not long after I arrived at The Times, we ended up having to mark one of the first big royal events. And we're sitting in leader conference, an editorial conference. And I remember saying to someone, I was like, what do we actually think? Actually, Giles, you might have been there. What do we, what, like, what, what do we think of being run by a country where the head of state is a hereditary position? I mean, we can't surely be in favour of hereditary anything. That surely goes against the grain of all the things that you would believe if you believed in all the other underlying principles of the times. And I remember uh, one of our colleagues, Giles's fellow uh, leader writer, Phil Collins, saying, look, the position of the Times is this. We are Republicans. The Times is against the monarchy. We think we should overturn it. It's just that we think that that is number 26 on the list of very important things that we need to do. And we're never going to get round to it. <laughs> and that is the reason we make peace with the monarchy. And this morning, as I was getting up, I was reflecting on the conversation of last night. And if you joined us last night, and some of you, thank you for coming back, I, we had this conversation last night. There were a couple of moments that made a really big impact on me. M Matt had this point about how we've forgotten to think about our history. We've forgotten to factor in history into the way in which we talk and think about ourselves. And that we've, if you like, compartmentalised history on one side or the other. Either we are a sort of UKIP nostalgia version of history, rah, 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 weren't we great, can't we go back to that? Or it's a victim version of history. We, we, you know, we caused terrible trouble, we did terrible things, you know, we should be ashamed of ourselves. And it was part of a broader point that Matt was making, which is, we're so sure we're right about everything, we either like to signal our virtue or our victimhood, and actually history helps us with a much greater understanding of uncertainty and mistakes, and, and, and the death of the Queen gets us closer to that thinking about history. And then Naomi, uh, who used to work for the Prince of Wales, made this really interesting point, which was so much of what we do is short term. So much of what we do is so driven by the immediate that having this counterweight, having this pull that is sometimes absurdly traditionalist, but sometimes necessarily kind of rooted in time and the past, is very valuable simply for the fact it makes sure our society pulls in these two directions. And the reason I was thinking about it was as I was getting up this morning, I was thinking, I suppose I would characterise myself as a lazy Republican, and I wonder whether I'm getting lazier, that the more I think about it, the less inclined I am to do anything about it, contrary to, you know, a colleague of mine, Patricia. And the interest in the institution beyond the personality of just the king, King Charles III. So I just think that we all come at this with some different kind of prejudice, you know. Um, your dad, you know, Paul Butler, the Bishop of Durham, was here yesterday, and I loved the way he framed it, which was, hey, you know what, I, I'm now a member of the establishment. I never thought I'd be here, and I come to see the value of it. I just think being honest about how we come at these things is really helpful. This is a way of 
making sure that everyone feels that they can come at it as kind of openly and candidly as possible. Liz mentioned last night that, you know, that there's a kind of inner Nick Witchell in all of us that is kind of <laughs> screaming to get out of the moment, and we can, can talk a little grandly about this. L let's try and get out what we really think or expect or worried about or kind of inquisitive about around the reign of Charles III, the family. Uh, let's not be shy about being too Hello Magazine about this too. There are family dynamics at play that are kind of interesting. Please weigh in on the chat. I I'm going to cheat because Pete's here and... Um, Pete, I'm going to not only not describe your former job correctly, but also not even pronounce it properly. So why don't you tell us what you used to do and then tell us what you think we'll ex we can expect of King Charles. Um, James, thank you. I was the uh, quarry to the Prince of Wales from uh, 2011 through to 2013. So uh, as uh, now our king, I, I worked closely with him and knew him fairly well. Um, having heard what you've said, James, I thought that, and as this is a thinking, that there are a few things to think about, and I would describe them as the big things and the little things, and the near term and the far term. In terms of the the big things that are are coming up, there is. Uh, the constitution and how he places himself within it in terms of his behaviours because people are going to be watching him like a hawk to see if he's going to be the activist king or if he's going to follow his mother's e example. There are the the various duchies and how they land in terms of the, 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 the handover between Duchy of Lancaster and Duchy of Cornwall and whether... And there is a growing voice, I think, for... Um, people looking at is it right in terms of how they're structured and what they are uh, and how they exist and how money is drawn from them and is that right in comparison with the other models that we have in this country um, the Commonwealth of course is another big one and I suspect in the new year that is something that he he as King is going to be having having to wrestle with in in conjunction with the the government and and those are just some of the big things that I think are slightly more long-term but on the horizon then you have the near-term things. Now, the first one will be things like um, the shape of the new royal family. He's going to be having to deal with that. And if I labour on that one just a little bit, just to give you all an idea of how things work within the household and what the implications are. When you had the full spectrum of members of the royal family three or four years ago with, yes, reduced, but the Duke of Edinburgh and the Queen doing official engagements and public duties as well as everyone else. In terms of a total number of engagements, you were looking at a couple of hundred from the Queen and Duke of Edinburgh, a couple of hundred from the younger royals, so uh, Princes William and, and, and Harry, 600 from Princess Royal, 600 from the Prince of Wales, a various number of hundreds from York, Wessex, et cetera, et cetera. These are 600 a year? A year. And those are overseas ones as well. So you'd be doing 70 to 90, the Prince of Wales would, uh, overseas. When you add all of those up, it was probably two and a half to 3,000 engagements, activities, sponsorships, pa patronages, events, hardy annuals, which were, you know, the classic Ascot, Sandringham's, uh, you know, flower shows, the state openings of parliaments, the investitures, et cetera, et cetera. If you strip the monarchy right down to the new model that's being uh, effectively um, sort of uh, for run, then you're looking at probably dramatically reducing that down to less than four figures in terms of the ability of members of the royal family to service those things. So that all has to be factored into what the royal family does in the near term in terms of its roles. The next one in term, and one of the things I did for the, the now king was run his diary and, and his engagements was you have hardy annuals as well as the things that come up that people request you to do. His job right now will be to set what he's going to do over the next year, because if you don't cut things away and drop them now, you're pretty much committed to them for the rest of your life, which is one of the big challenges, and that's why they became hardy annuals, things you just socially could not not do, otherwise you'd be regarded as snubbing it. So that's another near-term issue for him. Um, interesting, interesting. Do you think they would have already... I mean, they knew this was coming. Presumably they've already, they've already done that calendar. So it's, it's been mapped out. The question is whether they reveal it and forerun it and say, this is what the King's Diary is going to look like over the next 12 months, Just which would be... So what kind of thing will they drop? I mean, Ascot or something like that. Do you think there's some of those things they'll drop? Exactly. And this then comes into my next point in terms of a near term, the estate. 
He's got Hoiny Wormud, he's got Highgrove. Oh, he's, got he's got what? He's got Wormud, which is his Welsh house, Highgrove, Sandringham, Bermoral, Burt <coughs> Hall, Clarence House, Buckingham Palace, Windsor Castle. If you're going to do things near term that have implications for things like diary and um, uh, you, you then de decide what you're going to do with the estate, this is also quite unsettling for members of the public who've been used to these things being used over the last 70 years in the way they have. So there may be some smaller in, in, in his eyes because he's also emotionally bonded to quite a few of these locations as well. For example, Dumfries House, Castle of May, up in, up in Scotland, which were his grandmother's. <coughs> So, I, Are those two different places, or are they the same place? Yeah, Castle Maze right up at the top, which was the Bose Lions original family home. And then Dumfries House was his project to, to save Dumfries House for the nation down in the, in the lowlands of Scotland, as well as Bermoral and Burke Hall. And so... So hold on, he, so he now has four houses in Scotland? That he has a, has a direct influence or, or interest in, whether emotional or actually in terms of ownership, ownership. for example, the Bermoral estate. So I guess what I'm rattling out in the space of five minutes is a series of comple complexities and things to be considered that actually have to be either quietly or officially announced that he's going to do, which are going to be either unsettling to the public or are going to be significant changes from, from his mother. So hold on, let, let, let's, um, I'm not very good at these. What are these things called? These, like these four square... Quadrants. Yeah. So, so, so in... in in this corner, you've yeah. got your little and near term, yeah. big and near term, yeah. big and long term. Yeah. C can we just talk a bit more about the big and... I don't know which ones everyone wants to talk about. Can we just have a go at big and long term? Yeah. Commonwealth seems to me like big and long term, yeah. Jamaica, etc. What, what else is in, in there, do you the think? The union. The union. I think union as well, and how much effort he's going to have to put in to holding the union together, if that's the political will and how much he gets involved in that, because the Queen was gently touched it with, with a couple of words, if you remember. People should think very carefully. Yes. So just to get... So, so does everyone... So I, I'm intrigued by that. That particular story is one of the most interesting ones, like, in my lifetime about monarchy and politics. Yeah. I had a conversation with a member of the royal family, and this I'm not going to disclose because it's a bit... Un, it, it's not right, which was about that particular phrase. So people will remember 2014, wasn't it, the Scottish referendum? The weekend before the Queen goes to the church, it's the church in Balmoral. On the way, she stops and someone asks her, what do you think you should do? And she says, you know, I think people should think very carefully uh, and then walks into church. So the co per person I had a conversation with said something very interesting to me. They said, we had a big debate about this. And the way it was presented was that Charles and William, and particularly William, was really adamant that someone needed to come out and say something because if you lost the union, you lost the monarchy. That the union in some ways was, was more important to them than the... The, than the monarchy, and therefore she was persuaded to come out and just touch the tiller. It, it looks to me as though the politics of Scotland are moving further away from a union, at least that's the way the polls go. What do you do if you're Prince Charles in this? Because you don't have the weight of authority mm. that she did. That's true. Um, do you do you do you express your view as as um, as carefully but as um, well placed as she did, just so that your view is known? I mean, his affinity with Scotland is almost matched to his his mother, the the Queen, in that he yeah. spends about the same amount of time, just a slightly less than his mother did in Scotland. So he has a hugely close bond to it, and a number of properties he's interested in up there as well. So, without wishing to speak for the King, I suspect his views were were precisely aligned with his, mo his mother's. My personal view was that if you are the head of state and the, the actual components of that state are in jeopardy, you probably have more of a, an ability to speak to that than almost any other political issue. Uh, and, and people, what about in this, just in this corner, little and near term? So it seems to me to be dad and the boys yep. is little and near term, yep. but it's... Yeah, and and for decisions on what you're going to commit to over the next year in terms of the things you do. And what about just being quite scratchy? 
right? Like, the, the, how many people here have seen that little piece of CBS footage about the pen? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, that's fewer than I thought. Uh, hands up if you've seen it. Okay, that's everyone. So, uh, so, so, I thought that was really that's a problem. I mean, it's not a big problem, yeah. but it's little in near term if he's a much tetchier person yeah. than the Queen. And by all accounts, he is a much tetchier person. Um, without being, without wishing to be too indiscreet, uh, the Queen's poker face was immaculate. He doesn't have one, and yeah. so you're going to see that. Um, that's as bluntly as I can put it. Yeah. Um, it is. Uh, OK, it is, it's not something that's almost within his gift to control. It is, it is him. He, he is a far more emotional human being. Yeah. He also, uh, I learnt an enormous amount from him in terms of emotional intelligence. The way I saw him, him interact with people in terms of compassion and his ability to deal with people in distress was phenomenal. Yeah. I've never seen anyone like it. It's just brilliant. So that's what you get. It's baked in. Yeah, Emma, do you want to win? I was just going to say, actually, I, I had real sympathy for, for him, both when he was signing um, in a service in London and also in Scotland, because think about it, this guy has been, like, scrutinised and awake, he's old and travelling, he's just lost his mother, and he's sitting there, and I remember seeing one in London where he had, the, he had them to sign, and then he had this here and this here, and he's trying to move it, and everyone's just looking at him, and he's live on television, and I'm like, it's a stressful situation, like a really stressful situation, so I feel yeah. like people sort of criticising him for being slightly tetchy about that, it was like, you sit there, you do that, and you don't show any kind of emotion or any kind of stress when you know you're signing probably one of the most important things and you've got this ink thing and things are going everywhere I mean so so I think that's pretty brutal when people are being tough on him about that at this stage of the game I, I think I, I think it is Emma although and I think it was it was interesting you know Matthew and I were having a conversation with someone at the BBC this morning and I was thinking if the BBC had picked that up if that had been a BBC clip we would have had a hard time because some people would say, look, this is a son who's lost his mother. He's in a period of mourning. Get the camera out of his face. That's not particularly thoughtful. Um, then again, it tells you something. Sorry, Charles. I'm just interested in the logistics of that. How is it that CBS got that and mm. BBC didn't? Well, surely mm. it was all it was pooled. It's all pooled. I don't yeah. know. And, I, and, and, and if it was pooled, then if CBS happened to have the pool camera, then why didn't, why didn't the BBC run it? run it? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Charles, while you've got the mic, can I just ask you about two things just on the back of Pete? One is the estates, because you looked at all this yesterday, the estates, and what you think about the... As, as far as we can see, the choice is already made, and what, because the implications of what Pete says actually drives you to Charles's decisions, but what you wrote yesterday actually says, suggests that William has a bunch of decisions to make. Yeah, I mean... David McClure, uh, rest in peace, and um, Lord Berkeley, know, and you, I'm sure, Peter, know a lot more about this than I do, but the, the bottom line seems to be that um, income tax is paid on the revenue of both duchies voluntarily, but the amount is fixed by sort of informal arrangement with the Treasury on, on which tax is paid, and there's no corporation tax and no capital gains tax, and those three things, the, the informal arrangement by which expenses are deducted and tax is paid, the no capital gains, no corporation tax, uh, seem to be grit in the system that will only generate more indignation on the part of Republicans, anti-monarchists, time it, goes isn't on. It, isn't it indignation on the part of like the teeniest, tiniest percentage of the population who are going to pay attention to these things? I mean, if you were quasi quoting, you wouldn't touch this with a barge pole, would you? No. Uh, I mean, yeah, we're talking about 85 versus 15 percent of the population who, like, 15 percent. 15 percent of Republican. Isn't isn't that around that? Is that right? That but, seems high. But, but I think it's a fair assumption to say that if 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 that split changes, it's going to that way. That way. I think um, what it is, and the way it was described seven or eight years ago, and, and in fact ten years ago, when it was going in front of the Parliamentary Select Committee, was it's a it's a historic anomaly, and it's a 700-year-old construct that 
is it a business? No. Is it as a traditional sort of land holding? No, because it get, gets passed on by role and job rather than ultimately, well, the sovereigns does by, by death. And so it was never neatly placed into any one thing. And that's, I think, probably how they would like it to continue. And I read, I did re read the piece and I thought, yes, you know, I do recall that, you know, they go over to the Treasury and then there's a, a broad range of discussion on the treatment for the various components of it and, and what the amount is going to be, which is, again, completely unique. Um, but they will always fall back on the historical anomaly of a duchy and what it actually is. Just a, a reflection on that, on the, on the duchy, and more broadly on the kind of private activities of the, of the royal house. The thing is that I live one third of my life here in the UK, and uh, two thirds of my life in Spain, where the monarch is a kind of high-ranking civil servant that is hereditary. But the thing is that there is not this private uh, activity side. So the thing is that when you explain to someone that the heir to the throne controls a company that basically provides the organic products to one of the largest supermarket chains, it's something that sounds kind of very unusual to, uh, to somebody that is not uh, in, in, the, in the country. Obviously, as, as you commented, it's something that, good, that, yeah. <laughs> that comes yeah, from uh, several centuries uh, tradition, and the constitutional construct, obviously, is, is different. I think also, just to make a second remark totally different, um, I think one of the ill conceptions that people are having about these first steps of Charles' uh, reign is that the things that they say, oh, the things that, oh, the Elizabeth shoes are so big to fill and the things, that, but the thing is that I think it's, it's a, the, wrong, the wrong approach. The thing is that obviously Elizabeth II was a colossal figure, seven decades, and she, she was basically the person who brought the United Kingdom from the imperial age to basically this kind of mm. global soft power underpinned by a lot of kind of cultural, cultural power. The thing is that, and the thing is that I think the, the key would be to see that legacy as an advantage rather than a weight. The thing is that that path has already been, been tra uh, transitioned. So the thing is that, as you, as you mentioned, the thing is that there are other challenges. The thing is that we have war in Europe again. We have, uh, obviously, big geopolitical changes. Uh, the, the Commonwealth, the Jamaica situation, etc., more uh, pertaining to the to the uh, Commonwealth uh, more, more pressingly. But the thing is that the, basically the challenges ahead are of a different nature than the ones mm. uh, faced by, by Elizabeth. And I, I was quite uh, happy to, to hear that one trait that he seemed to have inherited is this basically what Boris Johnson was commenting about, the ability to comfort people and to kind of, that uh, he said that Queen Elizabeth had that, that ability to make everyone he, she talked to kind of feel better after the, after the after meeting her. So I think that is a, a good uh, positive. Yeah, I think. That, so I'm sorry, I've forgotten your name. I'm used Nacho. to. Uh, sorry. Nacho. Nacho, that's right. We've done so many of these things, but was, your name was always in the screen. I apologise, Nacho. <laughs> Chris, just, can I ask you just a minute? Uh, sorry to put you on the spot, but do, where, what do you? You know, I sort of started off with a kind of lazy Republican. Where are you on the sort of eager monarchist, lazy Republican axis? I'm or, kind of, so I'm, I, I guess I would describe a lazy Republican resonated with me, but I, but I suppose I also reflected, as you said that, that um, I, one of the things I've reflected on myself over the course of the last few days is whether I can afford to carry on being quite so lazy about it oh, interesting. in a new context. And, and part of that is to do with living in Scotland. So, you know, as I left, Edinburgh um, on Sunday to come down here. Edinburgh was just getting ready to um, uh, to greet the arrival of you know the late Queen and 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 all of that. And the streets were beginning to fill up. I live right in the centre of Edinburgh, so I kind of watched that un unfold, if you like. Um, and of course, since I've 
since I've been in London, um, things have un are unfolding down here. And I suppose just on that point about Scotland and the Union, um, I, I, mean, I don't know how it's going to play out, and I don't know what the answer is in terms of what, what the monarch's going to do, what the king's going to do, but it's a very tricky year um, to arrive in that place um, because, you know, you've got new PM to establish a relationship with the First Minister, which hasn't got off to a terribly good start, given what was going on during the, 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 the trust Sunak context. You've got, um, we're awaiting a Supreme Court judgment on, um, on, on what should happen about the referendum. There's a declared date for the referendum. So it's an incredibly tricky context. Um, there's, a, there's a lot at stake. I mean, arguably, the stakes are higher than they have been at any time since 2014 in a very volatile political context as well. And that's before you get to Brexit, Northern Ireland. Yeah, Emma, sorry, I'll come back to you. I'm going to come to Matt in a minute, I if I can. I on the Scotland thing. It's sort of a question. I just wondered, from a Scottish perspective, obviously there's the sentiment of wanting a referendum and independence, but I wonder what's the feeling of the Scottish people about the monarchy if you separate the two? I mean, I know they're kind of intrinsically linked and that's what we're talking about, but obviously there's a real sentiment for independence. But if you took that away, would they go, yes, actually, you know, we we like the monarchy and we, we keep the monarchy, or is there a very sort of, you know, republic view up there and anti, anti the monarchy? Because, you know, isn't, I was isn't curious about that. That the, the, that the SNP have essentially neutralised the monarchy question? Because, they did, in, they yeah. did in 2014, yes. I mean, well, you know, the extent to which that continues to be a, a settled view, and that's, I guess it's up for grabs now. Matt, can, can, I, can I bring you in? I don't know what you've... I'd like to hear what you think first, and I've got a couple of questions. Hi. Um, well, uh, no, I think it's very interesting, the SNP thing. The, because it was in 2014, we continue with her as head of state. Don't know whether it'll be the case with him. And I think that leads on to another very interesting, well, some other points. One, one is lazy republicanism, which is, I mean, I, I, I describe myself as monarchy monarch positive rather than or monarch curious sorry rather than monarch positive <laughs> i mean i'm i'm not i'm not there yet I, 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 but but i but, I'm, but I, I would struggle to call myself a republican i think and i think actually part of the one of the predicaments in all of this is the we don't admit to it but respectability is one of the things that brits love they don't love they, they they're very very keen on hence conservatories and tiling. Um, and, um, you know, there are a lot of lazy atheists in, in this country who describe yes. themselves as C of E. Yes. Because it's too much of it. I mean, God, reading Sam Harris and Daniel Dennett and Christopher Hitchens and then going out and saying, I don't believe it, it's a lot of trouble. Yeah. Believe me. Um, <laughs> So, so there's that. It's easy just to show up occasionally. For well, like, I mean, C of E is, I mean, the reason, uh, obviously, the, the, the two reasons the Church of England exists is A, um, Henry VIII's marital problems, but also because it, it so, so fits the national mood, which is to have a church where most of the people involved in it don't actually really believe in God that much. They, they do a bit. But that, that's sort of part of the, that kind of apathy um, and, in, and, in, and, and, and capacity to allow things to ride has its limits. And I think why I, was, I think you, the way you framed the style of thinking was spot on is we, we caught a lucky one with the Queen because she was so personally popular that we were able to postpone any discussion of the institution of monarchy in a meaningful sense uh, for as long as she was alive. Because she herself was so popular that any attempt to... Remember when Willie Hamilton, the Scottish MP in 70-something, wrote the book My Queen and I, and people said he should be hanged at Traitor's Gate, and you know, crazy, you know, people really lost their minds. But now we're being forced into a thought experiment where we're going to have to ask do we like this institution and do we want it to continue? Do we... can, can I ask you about that? So, just this is so. So, do you remember we had, even by our standards, a kind of preposterously silly and earnest conversation where we should have been talking about something else? Matt, Matt and I were 
flown out some ridiculous, I mean, literally Caribbean island to talk about... Happy days. Happy days. To, to talk to a group of people about things. And, and when we should have been sitting on the dockside, you know, just talking nonsense, we ended up having a conversation about institutional liberalism. Do you remember this? I, I do. Yeah. <laughs> people flocked to us. They found us attractive. <laughs> One local thing led to another. You know, people do you know what I mean? Local, you know, yeah. hamburgers, traveling It was tinkers. like, it was like, you, exactly. You know that Wham Club Tropicana video? That was it. It, it was, was like that. Only with institutional yeah. liberalism. Things, <laughs> things. Anyway, the institutional liberalism, I think that was the time that you said, what do we want institutional liberalism and when do we want it now? That was going to be our catch. Sound, catch. Came back. But, but the argument about it was this, was that this was the time when, post-Brexit and Trump, etc., that essentially everyone had said, look, the liberal ship has kind of run aground. Everyone has seen that it, the idea of liberalism doesn't work, free markets don't work, democracy doesn't really work, and, and the argument of institutional liberalism was that these... that, that actually, if you, if you invested in institutions, whether it was, you know, systems of the court, the rule of law, those institutions would protect the freedoms and rights of the in individual. And this was such a kind of unpopular idea at the moment because, hey, tech empowers the individual and it sort of, you know, degrades or destroys the institution. So it's a very long way around to getting to a point that I think is worth getting to. Danny Finkelstein wrote a really interesting thing today about Jews and Charles as the defender of the faith and being a Church of England king and being the, you know, responsible for the Church of England. And his argument was, I'd much rather have him be basically aligned to one particular football club than be kind of, you know, in charge of football altogether. Rather than being overseeing faiths, having a clear commitment to the Church of England, because with that, you respect the other faiths. And it was interesting to me that on Friday, King Charles made such a big deal of the Church of England. But you see where I'm going here. Is there a thing that might happen, just following on from your point yesterday about history, that what we're also going to see is a different kind of conversation about institutions and the individual? and that the politics of that balance, individual versus institution, shifts a little as we all digest what the monarchy means. Yeah. And, and, and I'm all for it, because I think um, after that happy um, uh, itinerant trip to, <laughs> to educate the Palmers, um, we had the prorogation of Parliament, which I remember we were, we, both of us, but also plural, taught us, was deeply worried about. And then that extraordinary day when the Supreme Court, yeah, in what I would call a, an absolutely classic example of institutional liberalism, handed down its judgment that the prorogation had been unlawful. Um, and at the end of it, I thought, more please. Um, and I think that he, he, is, he is less colossal a figure by definition. Um, through no fault of his own, I mean, it is, it is very hard to become a monarch at 73. When you're, when you're 25, which is the age that your brain stops developing, so they say, you know, stops forming, and you're uh, told in the middle of a, uh, of, 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 a, of a nature reserve in Kenya that you're queen, you kind of get on with it, and your character is formed by, your adult character is formed by that fact. When you're 73, yeah. there's been a lot of formation already. Yeah. Um, your attitude depends for yes. example, has probably had its ups and downs. Yeah. Um, and I, I think... Matt, what, that, those weren't the first times, by the way. No, uh, <laughs> and, and I was very interested. I think what Pete said was very fascinating in lots of ways, and I think that, that it, it'll be fascinating to see whether we can cope with a monarch who doesn't have a poker face, because, frankly, the poker face was the defining characteristic of the last one. Yeah. So that's a challenge. But it, but it extends into... Uh, it's no accident that the, the principal feature of this mourning period is the new king moving around the nations of the Union. It's very interesting to me, that. Because he, he, he's not staying in one place. And, no. you know, he, it, it's, it's, it's mobile all the way, air mobile. Connor, um, I'm, Connor can, can we bring in... 
Amber in a second and also Margaret Taylor. But first, number one fan, Dad. <laughs> I'm sorry to play that card, but um, I'm quite interested in this conversation and how it started, which is, where is Charles going to go? And this event has been thought about uh, for many, many years. Uh, a box has been made 30 years ago, and therefore a lot of preparations of how is it going to play. I took from his two speeches, um, one was things are going to change. Um, all of my dalliances in terms of charities and my plaything of Dumfries House are going to have to be offloaded to other people. So that the issue about the estates, I see him hopefully as taking on the poker face, as, as Matt talks about, and also to become a serious in the image of his mother that actually he's going to be bogged down with reading the red boxes. Uh. And if he does that, then in fact we can believe that all of the discussions that we've had about we, in spite of being probably correctly Republican, that we actually want a monarchy because we haven't got anything better to replace it with. So I'm optimistic that in fact he'll develop the poker face He'll do a good job of work for as long as he is able, because he's an old man by now. And that, you know, we can hope that, in fact, he can actually transcend the worry that I think is right to have at the moment is, will it survive? So th there is an interesting... So I heard a story today. I went to go and see someone who know, who's known him really quite well, known him a long time, and said... said something interesting about him. I don't know whether, Pete, you have the same experience with him. said that he's very conscientious really, really works hard, always worked really hard. And this is something interesting you don't often hear, in fact, excessively conscientious. And what they said was, you'll get a letter from him, right? It's eight pages long, right? When actually, thank you so much for dinner would have been fine, right? <laughs> and it was described to me that uh, this is, um, that the way in which they worked often, Camilla and Charles, was that they would have dinner at different times, Charles would have dinner separately, and then go upstairs and work on his correspondence. Right? And anyone who's worked with him said... He... So there's an interesting question about the red boxes, because what happens when you really, really... Like, how you allow those things... Be, uh, get across them, but don't get in them... I, I don't know what you think of that, Pete. If, uh... The red box went to BP, and if by half past ten it hadn't been completely swept through, then B BP, Buckingham Palace. Okay. Then, then I was like, I can't believe BP's in on this. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry. Um, They're everywhere, those guys. So if, yeah. If the red box was over, it'd been delivered, and it hadn't been completely done by t at some point in the morning. Then literally, the world was probably tilting off its axis. Right. He could days and he would dive in and you're at, you, your, your report is absolutely right in that he was incredibly conscientious and you know dinner would finish and then he would literally if it was a black tie then he would undo his black tie and he would work in his study till midnight um, yeah. almost met, you know like a metronome every night incredibly diligent and that is one of my concerns is he immerses himself so deeply rather than just cutting to the chase and just getting through it which is what his his mother did. Okay. I'm going to, um, Connor, will you bring in Margaret? And I sort of think Kerry is here. If he is here, I'd love to hear from Kerry because he's. M Margaret, you just had an interesting point about heads of state, and not least in the light of the election we've just had. <laughs> yes. Um, yes, I, I, I find it difficult when um, Republicans or anti monarchy say we'd be much better off with the president because um i don't there's no other sort of comment on that and i just think that whatever one does think of um the monarchy they and all the things that they don't do well they do a huge amount well mm. and i okay they have lots of um they have lots of property, although it was just mentioned that two of the properties of Charles, one belonged to his grandmother's family and one was something else. So I, I, I think there needs to be clarity on how much an, an ordinary rich person, of which we have many in this country, um, own anyway. Um, it seems to be that the monarchy is always um, 
implicated in being in doing the wrong thing or having too much simply because they're the monarchy and I think we have to we have to look at it um in the whole to see that in fact you know with soft power as people were saying um that they do do a huge amount and as I put on my comment um I need to impress on everybody that I'm a left-wing person so I say this I, I say this um, lo looking quite objectively at the monarchy and seeing what I, I think that they do do a huge amount. And I think to go through electing a president, um, I, I, I think to have the monarchy next to the what, what presents itself as our government at the moment, you can just see the difference. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm proud. Margaret, thank you. Sorry. I think a fair few people not, nodding, at, nodding at that. Uh, I, Lewis, I'll, I'll come to you in one second. I just want to see if we can hear from Kerry, if he's there. I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you fine. Um, I just wanted to pick up on something, a sort of thread that people have been tugging at, but maybe there's a little bit more to say about it. Um, and this, since we're sort of declaring our colours, I probably pitch myself as a, as a slightly less lazy Republican than you, definitely higher than number 26 on my list of my priorities and so my sort of general feeling over the last period has been that I feel like we've seen the best of the monarchy and it's still not good enough. And for all the reasons that you mentioned to do with, you know, equality and modernity and whatever. Um, but the reason I say I think we've seen the best of it is because I think because of the because of the emotional attachment that we've seen played out over the last over the last week. And I, and I think I, I wouldn't have thought sufficiently about that before, but I've thought a lot about it this week. <clears throat> I actually, I hope you got your hobnail boots on, James. I'm going to drop. I'm going to drop a terrible name. I was. I read. Um, I was reading a, a old, obviously old Walter Badgett thing over the weekend, where he talked about one of the advantages of the constitutional monarchy being that it allows people to identify. To, to, in fact, the a constitutional monarchy can, can embody the whole of the country, mm. the heart as well as the head. And I think that's one of the things that we've seen, um, you know, across the country in the last few days. Um, we've seen we've definitely seen that identification this week. People aligning their own grief with the, the sort of national grief. And that's a, another thing that I probably wouldn't have recognised as being as important as I think it has been um, until until just now. I think what struck me is the Queen has been like a really brilliant vehicle for um, for that emotional attachment. So aside from that sort of danger moment in 1997, she's been a really accomplished blank slate for people to, to, to inscribe their emotional attachment upon. Uh, partly because of, um, partly because I say she's a blank slate, but also I think partly because you know, she's a, she's the matriarch of a family that's been through the mill. And there's a degree of identification there as well. I, I, I wonder, I doubt, whether Charles has the ability to be to carry that emotional attachment in the same way. Partly, partly because of tiny things like the pen thing, mostly because of much bigger things like what we've learned about him over the years, what we the opinion that we formed of him through through the whole dire episode. And I guess my, where I end up in all this is that if, if Charles ends up only being respected, then it seems to me the monarchy's in a bind, that, that there has to be a real chunk of this population that, that, that loves the monarchy. I'm not sure how many people are, are going to love him. And I would put being loved in Peter's top right quadrant as big, big and long term, because I think it probably matters an awful lot. That's interesting. Being loved, from the I was actually writing in the bottom because it's a long-term thing. Can I ask you a different thing, Kerry, which, which is, I wonder whether we're looking at this also through the wrong lens, because we were talking about where things go from here. Who do we think is having, if you like, sort of be kind of quite so sort of blunt about it, but a, a, a successful handling of the death of the Queen? Right. So, for example, I think to myself, if you're the BBC, you're four days in, it, it, things are going to plan. The Sunday Times is writing, you know, you're covering this well. 
Do you think to yourself, oh, OK, hang on a second, this is like 2012. I'm going to come out of this thing with a following wind. I suddenly have a chance to capitalise on our place as the kind of public square of the nation. We, we should come out of the blocks on Tuesday with 100 days of what the BBC is for. Or if you're the Church of England, if this, these next 10 days goes, goes well, alternatively, if you're Downing Street, you're like, we're not, we're not, we're not on the map here at the moment. We can't work out how to speak. And it's all going to land on our plate on Tuesday. I don't, don't know. I mean, institutionally, Kerry, I don't know whether any of that resonates with you. Is there any, I mean, if we take the BBC, for example, if that is the case, what do they do on the back of it? I mean, I suspect I mean, the BBC is having quite a good, quite a good time of it, isn't it? It's, it, I think it will have gone, you know, we, we used to rehearse these things you know, pretty often. I can't ever remember rehearsal going as well as the real thing has gone. We started one by playing the Royal Anthem at the wrong speed on a, on a at 45 instead of 33, which set on an old vinyl record, which set a tone that we didn't want to keep up. Um, so I think, but I think... I ran into someone today, I had to recall the story where actually I had a, one rehearsal I'd, we did, only one person of the whole 120 people showed up, did the wrong thing. Unfortunately, it was me. I forgot to bring the channels together. That was the only thing I had to do was make a call and bring the channels together. And so the other things were all playing, you know, quiz shows when we should have been doing. It was not so good. But so what I do you think, think institutionally? In the end, I think the BBC will play it gently because the, 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 the equation for it is so lopsided that the, the downsides are massive. Uh, and the upsides of doing the job that people expect of it are relatively small, I think. So I think, I think they'd be naive if they think there's a huge grounds groundswell of public support that they can capitalise on. I mean, it'll, it, 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 it it stops it stops their support being eroded, but I think it probably plays to people who supported them pretty solidly anyway. It's probably true of politics as well, isn't it? I think the, the political upsides are relatively small and the downsides are great so um i'm not sure that i see where how people how those institutions will be sort of playing this through in the uh, you know in the next days and weeks there will be i i i don't know i think there will be some i think the downing street issue is a thing i think for example if you're a newspaper you're running a newspaper business you think are we coming to the end of the kind of commemorative bump around these things is that our newspapers not not what they were. So, so I was going to come to Lewis. I'll come back to you in a second, Pete. But Lewis, there you go. sorry, sorry. <laughs> Hi. Um, just on the, I was reflecting when we were talking about the pen incident and something you said, Pete. I, I actually wonder whether the the kind of demonstration of him being a human being will work, can work to his, his advantage, and if if his stated aim or what we're led to believe is his stated aim is to create a kind of warmer, mm. cosier monarchy that we kind of can connect with a bit more, which we didn't, you know, apart from, an, from my understand, I didn't ever meet her on an individual level. You got that from the Queen, but you didn't get that in the same way, apart from sort of very specific moments in our history. But I also wonder whether that could be a kind of disadvantage to him in terms of the way that the media treats the monarchy now. And I, I'm not saying that there's been a kind of an overt deference within the media, but I just wonder whether you, you, uh, Kerry mentioned our, our kind of relationship with Charles is very different and, and you know, Diana and, and everything else. And I just wonder whether he opens himself up to greater criticism than his mother would have come under and greater scrutiny and, and sort of, anyway, I just wonder, actually, maybe we see a very different relationship between the media and, mm. and Buckingham Palace in, in the future under his reign. And that could be something that makes life more difficult. There, there, there must be that, because it must be. I mean, if you were at the Sunday Times, I mean, you've run a series of pieces on Prince Charles, donations, yeah. handling of cash, and that means you've had a bunch of run-ins with his lawyers. You've got a much testier relationship with him than you've ever had with the Queen. I hadn't thought about that at all. That must be right. Pete, and then I'll come to you, Liz, if I might. I was yeah. on one of those trips. I never saw that. Back. No, I know. <laughs> um, uh, I just, I'm a very, very lazy Republican, uh, which may surprise you given, given what sure. I used to do. Um, 
but it, a bit a bit like democracy being truly appalling with everything everything else being worse i that's why i support the monarchy i just wanted to pick up on what kerry was saying because the three words that were being used there were the the, the monarchy the institution and the bbc in, in a former career i was an officer in a parish regiment and spent a, a fair bit of time fighting in afghanistan and a village elder in conversation with him was talking about world events and credentializing it by saying i heard this on the bbc mm -hmm. absolutely adamant that that then then it's verified and it's true and the respect for the, for the institution and when i worked for the royal family and afterwards as well when i traveled around the world when they were talking about the queen even in a country that had a queen as a head of state and i did visit there with with the prince they were only talking about one yes. person so i guess my point is in terms of the monarchy and institution um it is valued far more externally than we probably realize um and that is something again i'm not sure where it sits on the quadrant but it sits in there somewhere in terms of its value to us as a nation yeah But, sorry, but surely the, the conclusion is the opposite of that, isn't it, Pete? In that, when you showed up in other countries, the Queen was the Queen. Is it going to be the case? Exactly. Is she... You know those things where people used to say that David Cameron was more popular than the Conservative Party, or Boris, for example, was much more popular. Is the Queen much more popular than the monarchy and Britain? I think it was longevity. It had gone on so long that it was you know, almost axiomatic that it is the Queen. That's what... Is he going to try and replicate it? Can he? Or is this going to dissolve? Liz, what do you think? Uh, yeah. Um, can I do Hello magazine? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Such a relief. So, <laughs> what I'm interested in... <laughs> What I am interested, what I found myself becoming interested in is um, William now. Yes. Because King Charles, um, long may he reign, 25 years tops, right? And so the next chunk of William's life in his problematic marriage and with his children growing up, having inherited all the difficult financial how your fathers with the duchies and all the rest of it, I think is very interesting because we as a nation have been, um, he, he, you know, he's been protected, almost fetishized as the perfect son a little bit because of all of the rules and everything that was right uh, from the time that when he lost his mum. And he's now what Charles was when Charles was the bad guy. And I think that is interesting because he will observe his father's experience of being the monarch carrying the baggage with him and i, I just think that's an interesting set of dynamics to play out something don't you think though now we're in the territory that we want to be in yeah haven't they played a blinder on harry who william and kate the, this whole the firm in the last mm. you know four days the, the, when we were in at kite Tina Brown said, you wait and see, when the Queen dies, Harry will be on the balcony, right? And mm -hmm. as close as you can get to the balcony, that's what we saw today, he's, he's not excluded. I don't know what that is, what being an ex-royal is, what, what is, is, not, is he an ex-royal? Is that the, the, the supposed status? Non -working. Non -working. He's a non-working royal. I don't know what a work... But he is, but he is, he is, of course, a working royal, isn't he? Well, he's, got he's not in the uniform. You see, I don't think there are monarchy, but he is working as in he works. He's a grand. He's a grandchild. Yeah, that's that's the thing. I don't think that they get any props for remembering to ask the grandchild to come and like be there at the funeral. Do you know what I mean? I th I kind of feel like oh, that's entry level stuff, guys. Yeah. Oh, I see. <laughs> Totally and they included Andrew. Yeah. And they didn't let him wear his uniform. They did, they did, certain, they did certain small things to, to still say, we've got the upper hand here, I think, were the subtleties yeah. of that. So, yes, you're there. And like you say, I think it's but a no-brainer. But you're still brainer. getting snubbed. But you, yeah, but you can't wear your military uniform. 
and you know and he's one of the people that actually served, served yes. like i mean properly served so, so you so thought that thing of seeing william in uniform and him with the uh, um medal what was it on what was it? I don't know what he was wearing, but it was oh, some he had medal. A morning of morning suit and one thing, and then the other. Yeah, but but just basically kind of a suit. I mean, he had his, his medals. But, but but your feeling was that was sort of putting him in his that, place. Yeah, that is that, that. Those are the little things that are we're still kind of putting in your place a little bit. I don't know if people agree with me, but I think. That's Tina, what you, I'm sorry. I, I will have to yeah. agree with that. I, yeah. I have to agree with that. You you can't have it one way and another. I think it's absolutely right. They're there, him and Megan. Absolutely. But for how long and what the future holds, you know, that's something completely different. But I think it would have been terrible if they wouldn't be there. But, you know, that would Alice, have been you say? unthinkable. No, I, was just gonna say, I think it's, it's really interesting because this is both like the firm and the family as close as it gets. But I think uh, I'm second guessing what Harry would feel here or anyone that understands all the nuances of the uniform. I think that is a big snub. I really do. And I think the every I agree with Emma every uh, moment that they've tried to show the difference between the working roles and the non-working roles they seem to have done so um, but they the, there would be outrage as you say if he wasn't respected as a as a grandson yeah. Matt, yeah, just very very quickly um, uh, to use your quadrant big and short term yeah. Harry's memoir is going to be like Explosive. it's that's going to be like Andrew Morton's book but with the author on the record and available for, you know, interviews, opera, Netflix, you name it. When is that? Uh, well, uh, it, it appears to be. It was. It's slated for this autumn. That's that's what so it's, it's in. Written. Oh yeah, and the the ghostwriter. He was named in the the press. I forget who it is. Anyway, it's it's all done. It's ready to roll. Um, and the uh, publishing house was umming and eyeing over when to do it. But it certainly won't be a long time. <sighs> I'll just show you and say. Yes, uh, one uh, quick kind of constitutional point about Harry and um, with a risk management hat on, <laughs> the thing is that if the person who is uh, to occupy the throne, the throne. So things that a couple of uh, sad events would, would have to happen. Obviously, is uh, is still an infant. The thing is that the regency would fall uh, uh, on the uh, next in line, who is over 21 and resident in the UK. Given William residence in the US. That would be Andrew. No, Harry's residence in the US. Sorry, Harry's residence yeah. in the US, sorry. That would be Andrew. So, kind of, with a risk management hat on, I think maybe a repatriation of Harry could be advisable. Ha, huh. interesting. OK. Um, so, so I, I'm trying to be more sort this of. This afternoon, in terms of whether, in fact, Harry has been well managed or not, the performance of the royal family as they left the Great Hall was immaculate. Uh, but Meghan grabbed his hand, showing that, in fact, she's still quite active. So for the two of them to walk away from Great Hall, hand in hand, away from the catafalque, I think indicates that they've got a problem ahead of them. Yeah, With Harry. Ellen's behind, Ellen's nodding yes. behind you. Alice is nodding yeah, behind you. That was exactly what I was going to say. On the clip side, because I'm sort of defending Harry and I think she is wearing wear his uniform. I think there's so many subtleties, because that's the other one. It's like all they had to do was get out of the Great Hall. I mean, I, I heard actually, I think Zara and Mike also held hand in another footage. So, so let's not just hold them out. But it's like that was a very small thing that they could have just respected sort of the tradition there. But I felt that that was a subtlety Are of. You all no, they were. I mean, none of the others, like you know, oh, Charles and uh, sorry, King Charles and the Queen Consort, and you know, everyone. And then they sort of grabbed hands, and it's like you could have not done that. And that feels a little bit like her sort of pushing back a little bit. I mean, possibly, obviously, she's on show. She's probably very insecure. She's in a really difficult position. All of those things. She's a tactile person. And when they were walking around outside of Windsor and they held hands, no drama. They're a different kind of couple. But I just, I felt that that felt slightly inappropriate at that moment as well. But Charles, hang on, Charles is... He's disagreeing with me. Definitely. I mean, did you see the footage of um, Meghan in Scotland? And uh, 
the way the crowd was dissing her. I mean, it I was... I didn't see that. It's, it's just shocking. It's horrible. I have nothing but sympathy for her, and it's the first time anyone with a bead of talent has walked into that family. It's not surprising. <laughs> James. I just have a question, which is who makes that decision to not let Harry wear a uniform? Is it Charles? Is it palace officials? Are yeah. You, do we know? And, it's, and, it's, and it's, it's Charles through the... It's, it's Charles through... It goes up, I believe it goes up to... Does it go up to, like, um, someone in the military and then some, one of the senior people in the military and then eventually to King Charles, and he is the one that can find... Yeah, I thought so. So him. after his whole kind of reaching out to them after the Queen's death and then obviously welcoming them back from... It's, it's just a strange mixed messaging mm -hmm. thing going on. There is, oh, all right, so I'm going to, because I'm trying to, I'm not doing a good job ever, so ever on the time. I'm, I, I, so I'm, I'm just trying to sort of pull threads for wh where we go next week, partly because Liz and Mark and I are trying to get right what we do and how we do thinkings through the rest of the year. Um, partly it's because we're just, as you may have noticed this week, we're also trying something which is slightly different, which is not to have someone who's an invited speaker, try and bring people into the room. We had this nice thing last night with the Bishop of Durham, who's kind of in it. We had Pete show up this evening. There's something slightly kind of gentler about not feeling as though you've got an invited guest who's got to kind of give their spiel and plug their book. But there's also a question, which is how do we use the conversations we've got to try and really get to grips with some subjects that are interesting and difficult and they get somewhere? I, I do think there are interesting things here to tease away at about what Britain really is, where it's really going, and whether it's about our relationship with history or our relationship with institutions. Or I do like... I mean, it's quite interesting when you look at this quadrant. If you, if you Even if you took the royal family away, right, what's interesting is you've actually got activism, money, shape of the family, relationship with the world, the union, and respect and love, right? They're quite interesting themes for thinking about the way in which we think of ourselves and the nature of Britain itself. So I think there's a good deal here. Uh, I think that the, I think that the, you know, hearing from Kerry about a family that's doing its best that's not good enough, or kind of Lewis thinking about the way in which institutions behave differently, I think that's great. And I do think we've got to figure out a way. Uh, Liz and I and a gang people were talking about podcasts. Uh, I mentioned, you know, how does that make you feel? We are also thinking about one called It's Beneath You, where we talk about all the things that we think we shouldn't be talking about but we're really interested in. And let's face it, there's a fair bit of that around. So we'll, uh, we'll work on that too. Um, for this evening, thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thank you for the conversation in the chat, not least showing quite how much support there is for the, uh, uh, the royal family and how lazy our lazy republicanism should be. Uh, thanks for everyone. Uh, taught us who stuck around this evening to be part of this conversation. Those of you who came in and joined us, uh, have a very good evening. Uh, and we'll see you tomorrow to talk about something even more personal, grief. Are you chairing it, Liz? OK, so Liz is in the seat, and we'll be thinking deeply about grief. Thank you very much.